Hello, this is Thomas K4SWL. If you're new here, I like to do real-time, real-life amateur radio field activation videos. What that means is I don't edit out any of the content in my activations. So when I get on the air, I keep the camera running the entire time. So uh, if you're looking for a finely edited video, this is not going to be the case with me. <laughs> so um, what I try to do is give you the experience of what it's really like to be in the field. Um, sometimes it's a little um, misleading when you see someone go out in the field on YouTube and they just like rack through a whole bunch of uh, contacts in a really short period of time. That doesn't always happen. And that's perfectly fine because um, um, going out and being in the field and playing radio, it's just all about just enjoying this entire experience. Don't feel rushed. Um, when you go out to do a park or a summit or an island activation, whatever. Today I'm at Table Rock Fish Hatchery, which is a small uh, POTA entity. Um, it's K-8012. I really love this spot. It's kind of ideal for doing parks on the air. And I thought I'd take a moment today to talk about when you arrive at a new site, and I'm gonna to try to do this with Table Rock. I've come here numerous times, but I'm gonna to try to think back to the very first time I came here. When I get to a new site, I scope it out and kind of think, where would I like to set up? And it sounds like it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Like it'd be really easy to sort that out. But in a way, it's more complicated than you might think because you really need to think through where you're setting up your station. And especially at a brand new site, one you're not familiar with. Now, there's a tendency for us when we go to a park um, to do an activation. I mean, summits, you don't always have a lot of choice. You need to be within the activation zone on a summit. In a park, you usually have a little more choice. But parks are also more public. They're more accessible to more people, so you need to keep a few things in mind. Um, as you can see here, I'm the only guy here at this uh, little picnic area at Table Rock. And um, so it's pretty easy to find a place to set up. I have never been here when any other groups or any other people have... Uh, popped by for a visit but the very first time I came here I didn't know that it you know that it would be so quiet so um, I'll tell you what I do when I go to a new park first thing I do um, I have to think through what kind of antenna I'm using if I'm using a wire antenna or if I'm using a vertical antenna or something like that because that'll have something to do with where I set up if I were setting up a vertical I would look for like a little clearing or opening where I could set up the um, antenna and then have the feed line run to it and that's really what I'm looking for is a nice clear open area where the vertical could uh, stand up and it wouldn't be touching tree branches ideally. If I'm doing a wire antenna then I'm looking for tree branches but before you even do that what you need to do is take a total assessment of site look around and the first thing I noticed when I came here was that there are lines running through this site. Now this is pretty common. Actually, even in state and national parks, you know, when they design the park, they're thinking about recreational use of the park. They're not thinking so much about amateur radio operators. So um, when I came here and I saw power lines, <laughs> I made a note of that mentally. And so when I saw power lines, which you should be able to see in this video up here, I looked to where they were running. I came through to the middle of the site and looked up to see if there were any power lines in any of these trees, running through any of these trees. And fortunately not. There are none here in this area, this main sort of open area here. But there are some here, and there are some here. So I want to make sure I'm well, like far away from those, so that there's no possibility of a wind gust or anything like that happening, and my antenna accidentally hitting one of those lines because that would be a really, really bad situation. Sometimes we think, we think about these things at home, right? When we're setting up our antennas, we are very conscious of where power lines, um, if they're above ground, you know, where they could be, um, cables and all that other stuff. We're thinking about that. We don't think about it so much in a park. We feel like we're out in the open, there's no problem. But you've got to be careful about that. So always look for power lines uh, when you go out. Next thing I do, is this site is obviously really quiet today, but they have set it up for lots of people to come here for classes and demonstrations and things like that. It's what this really long table's for, of course, like probably school groups and things like that. Um, if I go to a site and I don't know what the activity's going to be like, as an amateur radio operator, I'm, I have every right to be 
on that site if I want to, right? Um, as long as it's not forbidden for me to be on that site. And there are some parks that are pretty picky about it, um, but the ones I go to are not uh, picky at all, in fact. Um, I can pretty much, um, any of the parks I go to, I have permission to be there and uh, it's not an issue at all. There are some historic sites and archaeological sites and that sort of thing where it's a little bit more of a, it's, it's just more important that you check in and make sure that it's okay to operate there. I've talked to these people before here at the fish hatchery. They have no problem with me coming out. In fact, they, uh, one of the people that works here is very interested in amateur radio and one of the people who works at another close by fish hatchery um, near Marion actually is an amateur radio operator. So um, they're very well aware that we're here. Even so, I try not to get in the way of other people who come to a site to enjoy it. And I'll tell you the reason why. Even though I have every right to be here like anyone else, people aren't expecting an amateur radio operator to, to be here at all. And so they don't know what to be aware of. If I were to, for example, in this situation, um, set up um, like right in the middle of everything, and then a big group of people shows up, they don't know that I've got a wire antenna in a tree. And if I'm not paying attention, they could trip over the antenna. They could trip over the feed line, pull my, yank my radio off of the table. Um, you know, it may be a really bad situation. So I'm always aware of where my antenna is in relation to where other people could be walking. And I usually try to keep it within my field of vision. So when I set up my antenna, I try to keep it somewhere where I can see it very easily. Um, if I'm new to a site and I don't know how busy it is, I'll try to set up on like it's off to one corner of the site. So if a big group comes in, like a school group or something like that, in fact, that just happened at the previous park where I was, I set up off to the side so that a big school group came in of uh, elementary kids and they weren't really anywhere near me. I don't mind them being near me. In fact, I kind of enjoy when people come up and ask what I'm doing. But, um, but when I'm off and away, I'm not interfering with their activities that they're doing. So I'm in the middle of them, you know, uh, with Morse code or, or um, doing single sideband or something like that. So I'll usually try to set up off to the side. Um, in this case here at the fish hatchery, <laughs> it's just uh, after talking to the people that work here, the likelihood that someone would show up here is super, super low. But the first time I came here, I didn't set up in the middle of this. I kind of set up off to the side. But of course, I didn't set up over here because there are power lines over there. Next thing is, if I'm operating a vertical, like I said, I would look for a spot where I could set up the vertical and the counterpoise and my feed line so that it would be within my uh, field of vision um, while I'm operating. So like, for example, here, if I were to set up here, I would probably run my vertical here because there's an opening right here. So I'd set the vertical up right here, run my coax up to the uh, station and then probably deploy a counterpoise. I usually try to deploy my counter counterpoise in a place where other people would not walk. So I would probably put it up against the uh, uh, the side of the uh, hill right here, up against the shrubbery and trees and everything like that. Just in a place where you look around and think, where would people, where are they less likely to walk? And that's where I put counterpoises because no one that comes to a park is gonna be looking for counterpoises and feed lines and all those other things. Now for wire antennas, which is usually what I use, I scope out a site very quickly and find the branches I like best. I've mentioned this in previous videos, but I really like branches like say this one right here that sticks way out um, over this area because if I shoot a line up through that branch right there, that means that I've got all this area underneath uh, to deploy my antenna. Um, I can do an inverted V off this. I could do a vertical off of this. And it'd be really easy to do. In fact, if I deploy the antenna here, I could set up at that far table right there. And I know that I'd be out of the way of other people. And then I would pro probably face out so that I could see if someone was coming so I could tell them to kind of stay away from the antenna if I thought they were gonna run into it. Um, with a wire antenna, you don't want to set up necessarily in a really thick um, area with um, lots and lots of leaves and branches and things like that that increases the chance that your your throw line could potentially get stuck um, It's not common. In fact, it happens to me almost never But um, when it has happened, it's been when I've been in really really thick areas You want to try to find an area with uh, you know a branch that's kind of on its own Those are also these horizontal branches like this are very very easy to hit 
with a throw line. They just make it so, so easy to set up your antenna. Sometimes you don't have the choice though, and if not, then I just try to get it up as high as I can, and I don't worry too much if my wire is touching branches. People will say, well, if it's touching a branch, it's, you know, it's attenuating the signal, it's having a negative effect on the antenna. That may be possible. I'm sure it's probably, I'm sure it's the case, but I've never had a problem with that um, for doing an activation. Uh, it's never really been an issue. So like looking here, there are so many excellent branches here. When you're looking at branches and you're looking at trees too, it's important to find branches that could be potentially what they call a widow maker that could fall down on you. So like this pine tree right here, you'll notice a lot of branches on it that are missing bark. Those, if I threw a line up in that, I guarantee you that that branch should almost immediately come down, just probably with the weight of the line and the throw weight on it. So you want to make sure you're getting a solid branch and you want to make sure that you're not accidentally pulling down on something that could fall down on top of you. Those are all things you want to look for. You want to look for a living branch, uh, one that is going to be steady and strong and have no problems at all. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Now I actually need to set up <laughs> to do this activation. I will be using a wire antenna myself and now I'm looking around and I think I'm just going to set it up over here. Um, you know, just to make it easy. Or, um, I've done this in the past, I use this like little field out here in order to deploy a sloping antenna or something like that. Um, another thing I try to do is, usually I try to set up in, so that I'm not in the middle of a bunch of sunlight, uh, in direct sunlight. Uh, so I do that just to make it a little easier to read the display on the radio and that sort of thing. So I'll try to find something where I'm looking at where the sun's going at the time of day and just try to stay in a fairly shady area. That's my own personal preference. Um, if I've got the option, that's what I like to do. So anyway, let's get set up and, uh, get on the air. I'm looking forward to using my KX1 again. Uh, knocking out a hopefully a fairly quick activation and then moving on. Let's get started. Okay, so I just finished setting up the antenna and I actually did go for that branch I was telling you about and got it on the very first go. It was super, super easy uh, doing a side throw and making it into that branch. So here's my feet, here's my uh, throw line. And you'll notice I used up side of the picnic table just to hold up that end of the throw line so I could make an, invert, um, an inverted V shape with this antenna. Now, I didn't need to do that really, uh, but I did it. And what I did was I tried to pull it off to the side so it's not literally in the middle of this. I'm kind of almost in the middle of it right there where I'm operating. And it does take up a bit of the real estate here. But if a group were to come here, it would be super easy for me just to stop my activation for a second, grab that end of the line, bring it over, and reconfigure it so most of the antenna is out that way, and I just continue on with the activation, no problem. So that's one of the reasons why I set it up this way, and I'll be looking out this way in case a group came by. Again, the likelihood here at this particular site is super low, but that's something you always want to think about. Actually, I'm really, really pleased with uh, how this <laughs> Infed Half Wave is set up. Um, it's nearly ideal, uh, in a sense, so let's hope it works today. 20 meters was working really well earlier and 40 meters was kind of blah. So I think we'll just probably hop on 20 meters and see if we can do the whole activation on it. I didn't need this much of an antenna for it, but I didn't bring my 20 meter in fed halfway with me. If I did that, I could have just literally made a vertical straight up into that tree and it would have been just completely vertical. Uh, I went ahead and used, even though I don't need to, I used my full 50 foot of line here. Mainly just my thinking is that acts as a little bit more of a counterpoise. And I just made sure I didn't coil up the line anywhere. Okay, let's get the radio set up and get going. Okay, welcome back. I've got everything set up here. Interestingly, when I first set up the antenna, I had the feed point a little higher, probably about two or three feet higher than this. And when I checked the SWR on 20 meters, it was coming out at like 1.8 to 1. And it's still pretty acceptable. In fact, the KX1 would have had no problem dealing with that. And I could have used the ATU to smooth that out a little bit and find the best match. But instead, what I did was I went over here and loosened the uh, throw line a little bit and let the antenna come down to just about, you know, two feet off of the ground. Which really, when I trimmed the antenna to begin with, I trimmed it with about the feed point, about two feet off the ground. And so that gave me a one-to-one -one match. And that's one of the things that was off camera that I thought I'd kind of share with you. Um, don't assume if you're in-fed half wave. In-fed half waves, you know, the feed point location and the height of the overall of the radiator can have a big impact on 
uh, the um, uh, SWR. So just keep that in mind. Now let's see here. Let's go ahead and start this activation. Um, I'm going to use the message memory to start it. Okay, let's see, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So we're at about 17 something UTC. Ooh, <laughs> the repeat, so this is still a new KX1 to me and the repeat amount of time is a little longer than I would normally do. Usually I'd only have about three seconds. This sounds like it's set to five seconds. That's fine anyway. So it'll continue repeating until I hit the key. I have also set the other, the secondary, or the second CW message memory for RR, thank you, all that good stuff. Ooh, I just realized something I need to do before that starts getting people. I need to hook my camera up to a battery because earlier today I was doing an activation and used up a bit of the battery. I need to hook it up to an external battery real quick. If I can get this undone here. Off camera. Other YouTubers take note. Instead of stopping and editing out this, just leave it all in. That's what I say, just leave it all in. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is real life though, this is real life. Okay, let's do this again. There we go. Now the camera's got some juice.
Again. Am I missing a letter? Ah, oh, there we go. A, A, of course. Kyle, sorry about that, buddy. I don't know why I was hearing a W. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One more, and I've got a valid activation. Nice! This, okay, so on occasion when you get a spot like this, you really should do a full CQ call because that'll also help the um, reverse beacon network pick you up and spot you. Keep in mind I'm operating three watts of power right now. The KX3 only does about three, or KX1 only does about three watts of power. KX3 does 15 if you want it, I think. I'm gonna put this on repeat here. I got nine contacts in very short order. <laughs> this... Okay, I think it's. I got my 10 now. I got a valid activation already. I got 10 in eight minutes. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. 
That's really nice. But now the band's kind of dying down. Or I've worked everybody that's at the radio at what? 1.43 in the afternoon. <laughs> East Coast time. Did I hear a really weak station out there tuning up? This little KX2 battery, I have operated this on three full activations with one charge of that. And I bet you I can do three or four more probably. KX1 super, super um, stingy on uh, current and receive, so it really can use a battery forever. using a straight key. So again, when I do my full POTA CQ, the reverse beacon network will pick me up, and then the POTA network scrapes my spot and auto spots me, which is one of the reasons, in case someone's not actually, because you know, like with single sideband, you need people to actually re-spot you all the time if you can't spot yourself. Um, but with the reverse beacon network, it'll do it for you.
was that ZPH? You know what? I, I think I know what's happening here. They're just really close to my frequency. That's what that is. That's not actually somebody calling me. I think they're calling somebody else. That explains no response there. Okay, here we go. Let's get you in there. should add that you're hearing pumping in the audio. That is not the radio, that's the recorder. That recorder does not. That recorder, um, the AGC in it, somehow makes like that chugging, pumping sound sometimes with radios. one so photogenic. <laughs> Man, I'm such a radio geek. It is photogenic though, it's a beautiful radio. Okay. 
There we go, KB5 TCO. in the logs there, TCO. <laughs> this is awfully fun on 20 meters. I may move to 40 in a second though. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is move. Before I move to this 40 meter band, out of curiosity more than anything else, I'm now on the um, 30 meter band. And you have to press the band button on the cakes. When you can't see it here, unfortunately, the flicker rate of this LED display, along with the frame rate of the video, they just don't coincide. <laughs> but I can tell that I'm on in 10.062 move down here to 10.0113. Boy, I'm not hearing anything on here. 10.0113. Let's see here if I can get this to, if I engage the ATU. Okay. Because I've got a 40 meter infed halfway, which should be resin on 40, 20, 15, and 10, sometimes 12. Um, let's see if I can get this to tune here. Whoops. What am I doing? Wait a minute. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm losing it. Ah, 10, 1, 1, 3. That's what I want to go. Am I right? What am I doing? 10, 1, 1, 3. Hey, that's not bad. I'm getting a one-to-one -one match on 30 meters. Huh. See, the ATU inside the KX-1 is not as good as other Elecraft ATUs. It was, it was a very early, in fact, to my knowledge, to my knowledge at the time, I don't know of any field size portable radio that had a built-in automatic antenna tuner in it. The KX-1 did. And uh, I didn't realize I'd actually be able to use this to transmit on 30 meters with a 40 meter infed halfway, which means it's good enough to do that. Um, that's impressive. Um, yep, okay, so, hey, for kicks, let's just go ahead and do it. Let me find a spot here on the dial. Now, I will say another thing about this. So the KX1 doesn't have a surgical filter system like, you know, the KX3, the K, K2, especially something like the IC705. Uh, it doesn't have that kind of filtering. It's got a little variable filter. It's got crystal... See, it's 
So you can hear, it's about two, probably 2.2 kilohertz, 2.4. And then you can make it go to about probably 300 hertz. But like I said, it's not surgical in how, in, with really sharp skirts on the side of the filter. You'll still hear stations bleed in, but I don't mind at all. Actually, for a field radio, this is fine. I wouldn't use this for a CQ Worldwide contest or something like that in those kind of crowded conditions. But the receiver on this is actually really, really good. Um, it also has an RF gain control comes in super handy when you've got a lot of atmospheric noise and stuff that you need to calm down. Uh, that's kind of a nice thing to have in the course AF gain. Again, you're hearing pumping and that has everything to do with the AGC circuit and the Sony. In fact, I'm going to try to start using my Rode wireless go-to system for field recordings because I think it does a little bit better job with mitigating that. Uh, this has a hard time with the side tone level and that sort of thing making it work. I don't, I don't know why, but you'll hear a popping and stuff and I'm sorry about that. Not a lot I can do about it. I'm sure there's probably some way I could audio process it, but I'm just not familiar with that. So let's try this one more time. I'm, just, I'm kind of floored by this. One to one. Okay, good, good. Okay, let's start calling CQ here on 30 meters. Now it doesn't sound like there's a ton of activity here, but um, so now what I do is I move this down to play, which again, you probably can't even see this. Here we go. And I can tell that it's getting a good match because I'm getting about two and a half watts, two and a quarter, two and a half watts out. It's not going to be as efficient as it would be on one of the bands it's resonant on, but maybe if we can get at least one, one contact on 30, I'll be happy. Well, I'm very pleased to know this. <laughs> I swear, in the past, I've used this with... Um, now, this isn't that the same... You know, the ATU in my old KX-1 in Ruby, my other KX-1, it's an older KX-1 that wasn't built originally by somebody that knew what they were doing as well as the person who built this one. I know the person who built this one, and they are a top-shelf engineer. So this thing's like, you know, like a benchmark in terms of how it's built. So it could be that the ATU is built better in this, and because it, it involves coils and all kinds of other things, so it's probably just done better. So maybe it's matching, whereas Ruby, my other KX1, couldn't do it. Don't make fun of me for having two KX1s. This is my favorite radio, just one of my favorite radios ever in the QRP world, so. Don't you like these paddles? I do. They're quickly becoming some of my favorites to use. I'm rough on them. You hear me clacking them around and stuff, but I kind of slap them around a lot. Now, it's quite possible right now that these lower bands are just not performing as well, and that's perfectly fine. Oop, I hear somebody tuning up. I'll have a low signal report here because he's in Pennsylvania. Yeah, 
committing to another page here, so I'll have to stay on the air a little bit longer. Thought I heard somebody else in there. So this is very low QRP power. Whoops. <laughs> what I've been doing is I accidentally hit the wrong buttons over here when I when I'm about to play my message memory. <laughs> Just hit the wrong ones. I was about to engage RIT. We'll try one more here and then we'll move down to the 40 meter band. Just to cover all three bands of the KX1. Of this KX1. now, and I probably need to take out the ATU, bypass it. Let's do that real quick. You'll hear it click. There we go. Where are we now? 70, 58, okay. Our 1.0, got a one-to-one -one match. So yeah, this is a three-band model. This is 40, 30, 20. My other one's 80, 40, 30, 20. Um, so yeah, let's see if we can get anybody on 40 meters. We're, I'm committed to another page here on my book now, so I really need to get somebody. Uh, I'm hearing some more of that digital stuff. ATU. Let's go down to play. There we go. Okay, somebody work me now that I'm on my new page. <laughs> Remind myself to take a photo. It is so beautiful out here. Just look. Fall colors are out. Isn't this amazing? It's so pretty. I love this time of year. So yeah, um, on radios like the KX1, I don't want the ATU in in the mix when I'm on a resonant antenna because the ATU in this one, if it's on, it's kind of engaged a bit and it's just not necessary. You want to bypass it to get the most out of your antenna that's resonant. So I disengage, I just put it in bypass mode, which is calibration mode on uh, the KX1. Looks like I'm getting about two and a quarter, two and a half watts here on 40 meters. Don't go for a KX1 if you want a radio that can do 5 watts and higher because this is the maximum it really does is 3. You can tweak it to go a little higher than that. Um, I think that my other KX1, there are a couple bands but it'll do over 3 watts, like maybe 3.5 watts. But then there are some that are, I think the 80 meter band, I can't remember, it may only be like 2.5 or something. Okay, that was K. 
B9. so funny as I'm sitting here sending a message back to KB9 RPG. I'm looking at the antenna and the wind is knocking it around a bit so the feed point's going up and down and up and down. using uh he and i communicate quite a bit he just even when i was in quebec he's always like in my footprint my propagation footprint so he's one of the more reliable contacts i get and it's oh there we go and any 4 tn is also a regular one these days but Brian and I, just for some reason, we're just in each other's propagation footprint. So it, um, it's easy for me to work him, and so we, we exchange notes sometimes about the radios we're using and stuff. He's also written guest posts for um, QRPR.com. same thing. radio here about another 10 minutes maybe
to clean his contacts. down a little bit because I'm hearing some digital hash off the side. Jim. He's probably doing this from home. Jim's a great guy. Nope, that's not him. Okay. Okay, Jim. Try again, please. I really want to get you in there. He and I are, are the opposite of Brian. Um, Brian's in my propagation footprint. Jim isn't. Hard for us to work each other. Really hard for each, us to work each other. I've gotten him in the logs a couple of times, but he is an avid, avid POTA operator.
I'll use the memory here. <laughs> My fist was not working very well this morning when I did an activation either. I've been okay. Actually, this really improves my accuracy. I, the keys I use regularly all work well. hear that go off now. I'll stop my recording. There we go. So that was a lot of fun. I do love this KX2 or KX1 <laughs> rather. I really do love this radio. Um, I find it's just so simple and so easy to use. They are in really high demand uh, now because they don't make them anymore and um, people like him. I mean, there's, we're going through a little bit of a CW renaissance right now. And so with the advent of Parks on the Air becoming so popular here in the United States, especially, but also across the world, uh, complementing things like worldwide flora and fauna, uh, summits on the air, all that stuff. There've been a lot more people hopping into the world of CW and realizing just how much you can do with such small kit, very, very small radios, very lightweight, very low power, and what you can do with them. For example, in this case, let's go ahead and count this. I'm sorry, I'm going to do this on camera. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. So 35 contacts. Um, and, you know, pretty effortless, really. Um, it really wasn't all that hard to do that uh, with two and three watts of power. And that's one of the great things about uh, QRP and CW. They really do work well together. Don't ever feel like, I have to admit, I knew hams at one point, um, I still know hams like this, that are all or nothing when it comes to CW and, um, uh, you know, being like the only mode, right? <laughs> um, I just... I don't believe that. I think that our world of amateur radio is open to any and every mode. Digital mode, single sideband, whatever you can dream up, go for it. That's what makes our hobby so incredibly interesting and so cool is that there, it's just so wide open. And I have to admit, I personally really love CW. I just find it very pleasant. It makes for very easy activation. A lot less crowding on the bands that you find on single sideband. I mean, there have been times I've gone to the field and it's really, really difficult to find a place to, um, the, a free space on the band to activate. There were just so many other people on there in single sideband, whereas with CW, there may be the same amount of people on the CW portion of the band, but the bandwidth is so narrow that you can just fit so many more in there. So it's, it's way easier to find a clear frequency. I mean, it's just so many reasons. Using the reverse beacon network, see, I didn't, I, I did not self-spot here. I just don't have a good signal here if at all. In fact, it just kind of comes and goes. So I can't really spot myself here. I just schedule my activation with the Parks on the Air network with the Spoda, or the Poda Spots page, the Spoda Pots page. <laughs> okay. Um, and then when I come out here, as long as I'm in that time frame in that window, it looks for me and it on the reverse beacon network, scrapes my information and voila, I get an auto spot. And it makes it very easy to come out to some place like this with no, um, you know, no internet access or anything and um, hop on the air and for people to find me on the spot. So that's the really cool thing about CW that I love. Um, yeah, so, but don't ever, if you are really only in the single sideband, that's perfectly fine too. I love single sideband as well. And I'm trying to put a little bit more of that into my activation videos. One of the reasons I don't though, is because I like using a lot of these radios that are CW only. And so I, I really can't do single sideband when I've got these. I would have probably, had I used my ICOM IC703+, Plus, which is in my car over there, I would probably have done uh, a single sideband activation just now. But I'm a little frustrated with the 703. I need to do a mod to it to keep it from having keyer problems because it's um, picking up RF, just the little tiny bit of RF coming back to the radio, not much, even at low power, like two watts, is still enough to mess up the electronic keying in it. And so I just kind of put it up and said, I'm gonna use the KX1 today because I like using it anyway, frankly. And I've been wanting to give this one a nice thorough workout. Uh, so 
yeah, I love CW. I do a lot of CW here, but don't ever feel like um, CW is the only mode. But I would encourage you, if you are interested in doing CW, and especially if, you're, if you've paid attention to this video until the end right now, again, you should get some kind of reward um, <laughs> for doing it. But um, I have to assume that you're trying to learn CW. And if you are, don't give up keep listening it all eventually just sort of works in your head like you eventually get to a point where you just pick up what the cw is i remember when i first started doing these activations i mean i think i recorded even my second cw activation i may not have recorded my first because i wasn't really doing uh recordings of activations at that point um so probably didn't record that one but you'll see that my speed and interpretation's gotten better with time i don't feel it uh doing this but people write me all the time and say gosh i watched one of your early videos you were going slower it, was, it took you a little bit longer to get each one of the contacts and now it's a lot easier i find that you they become easier and then also you're able to pick out things in the noise like even if you've got a really loud signal you may hear like a k something at the very beginning and i can listen through all the other stuff and still hear part of that weak signal in amongst all these louder signals and i think if you found really good top shelf cw act uh, cw operators they would all be able to do the same thing like people on d expeditions um they're really really good at hearing just a whole cluster of cw activity and picking out one call sign in that one time on the first time i am not nowhere near there um, i've always dreamed of going on a d expedition at some point I, I would love that. I would love to go to Bouvet Island, which is like the next one. <laughs> of course, I'm not a not an operator that can do that, but I just dream of the day that um, you know my CW skills are such that I could actually be valuable on a D expedition uh, because I think it would be so much fun to do that. I have a real fascination with Antarctica, which is one of the reasons why um, I would love to do something like that at some point. But I'd have to really build up my skill set. I'm not sure I really ever will have those kind of chops. But for parks on the air and summits on the air. Oh, it's just so much fun. And I just heard from someone this morning that said they did their very first park activation yesterday. And um, they said they were going really slowly, but they worked 30 contacts in a short period of time. And they said every single hunter came down to their speed and worked with them until they got each contact correct. And that is the cool thing about the CW community and the Parks on the Air community is these are people that want to encourage you to push the boundaries of what you think you can do and open up new doors. And um, that's just wonderful. Okay, I better stop this. <laughs> it is such a gorgeous day today. Look at this. Man, I love this time of year. I really love it. Right now, the leaves are starting to change down here. Now, up at my mountain home, where I'm heading, the leaves are changing really quickly. Um, our, this is what, October 7th. Next week is usually what is considered our peak leaf uh, season. Uh, it's usually the second week of October is usually when, in our elevation of the mountains, is usually when it's really kicking in. But I just love this time of year. The air is kind of dry. The temperatures are mild. This morning I did an activation at Tuttle Education State Forest and it was almost chilly enough. I needed to wear like a long sleeve shirt or something, but um, I didn't do it, but I could have. It's just lovely here. When you come to a park, I hear this a lot in the soda world too. Um, when you're hiking, going to a soda summit, sometimes you get so focused on just making it to the summit, doing your activation, completing it, logging it, going and heading back to go on to the next place or whatever. You don't take a moment to just enjoy the scenery. And this is not exactly the most bucolic of all the parks I go to, but everywhere you go, look around and try to find um, these spots. And this is wonderful and peaceful and relaxing. And just don't forget to enjoy some of this. Yeah, I love it here. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> I do need to move on now. I've got some things to do in town. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, again, thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Coffee Fund. I really appreciate it. Like I said, it's never required. All of my stuff will always be free. But with YouTube changing things to where they're now putting ads even in the videos when I've turned off monetization, I can't really control that. One of the cool things about Patreon, if you join, is that 
you can look at videos that I put up on Vimeo. I've been paying for that service and for that bandwidth so that um, if you belong to Patreon, you'll always be able to watch one of my activation videos that I put there as well. And you can watch it without any sort of ads whatsoever. I turn off all that stuff and I can control that. And you can also download the video if you want to watch it later or replay it. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, as a service I offer to Patreon supporters because, frankly, the bandwidth, there are bandwidth limits to Vimeo. Um, I can only use so much bandwidth in a month. And if I opened it up to everyone, I would blow through the bandwidth uh, within a month. So anyway, um, I'm on a pro plan <laughs> and that would be enough for most people. But my videos are very long like this one. And so they, even if fewer people are watching them, it's using a lot more bandwidth. Okay, I think I've spoken enough now and rambled on. I hope you have a chance to go out and play radio this week. As I always say, be kind to others. All we got on this planet's each other. And until next time, seven threes.